good evening, everyone, uh, or good morning, or whichever part of the world you're from. I am Arish here from the Things Network, a uh, community manager here, and looking after all the communities and the communication side of things. Uh, tonight, we have uh, Chris and Terry from New York, who are going to be part of the webcast series that we've been going for a while now. And uh, without further delays, uh, I'll uh, let Chris and Terry introduce themselves, and then we'll continue with the series. Hey, so, Terry, okay. would you would you go ahead and introduce yourself? I need to restart my browser. It's using all my memory. I'll be back in two seconds. I'll be happy to. Yeah. Um, I, I, hi, everyone. I'm the uh, I'm Terry Moore. I'm the initiator of the Things Network in New York City and also in Ithaca, New York. So uh, my background is in technology. I, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called MCCI that does system software, selling mostly to you know, Fortune 1000 companies. Um, so the, uh, I guess I need to vamp while we're waiting for Chris to return. So, so uh, nice. thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so Chris, you ready? And we're back. OK, apologies for the delay. Uh, I'm Chris Merck. I work with Terry here in New York, uh, building out the network here. Um, I do some uh, consulting on a number of projects, but uh, the Things Network is what I am most excited about. Now today, I have a presentation prepared about propagation. So you should see the slides now. Um, uh, can you all see the slides? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. So I'd originally wanted to talk about regulation and radio theory, but as I looked into the regulation, I discovered that every country has uh, slightly different rules, and it wouldn't really be fair to give a talk to the global community about uh, regulation in the United States. So. I expanded the theory section a little bit and uh, want to specifically talk about propagation around 900 megahertz. Uh, propagation is how the signal gets from the transmitter to the receiver and lots of interesting things can happen in between and what we do there can affect how effective uh, the, the things network will be. So just some quick uh, preliminaries. Uh, number one, just I want to show you where we are on the map, where we are in the spectrum. Uh, so the Things Network in Europe and United States is operating around 900 megahertz, a little bit lower in Europe, a little bit higher in, in the States. Uh, we are in the UHF part of the spectrum, ultra high frequency above VHF where FM radio operates and below super high frequency where satellite broadcast occurs around 5 gigahertz. As you go lower in frequency or higher in frequency, the properties of the signal changes. So at very low frequencies, uh, such as uh, long wave radio down in just the hundreds of kilohertz, we see very high range. Uh, but you also need very large antennas because of the increased wavelength, and you have a very small amount of bandwidth available. This makes the spectrum at the lower end of the scale very valuable, and so there's a lot of regulation there. And it's not possible to set up a, a free-to-use free network uh, at 100 kilohertz because there's just not, a, not enough space for all users. As we go to higher and higher frequencies, up into the gigahertz, we have lots of spectrum available, but the range is seriously reduced. Uh, right in the middle, there's this sweet spot here, as uh, BBC refers to it in this image, where you have enough bandwidth that you can get many users and do useful things with the network, uh, but the regulations are somewhat relaxed, and there's an opportunity for us to even set up that free network. So I just wanted to show that balance uh, to kind of explain why we're in this 900 megahertz uh, region. 
the the second preliminary is about uh, decibels. So uh, for the less technical folks here, I just want to cover very briefly what a decibel is. So radio signals vary in strength over a very wide range. Um, a practical example is a node that's right next to a gateway has one signal strength. A node that's 10 kilometers away that's just barely making it into the gateway may be 10 billion times weaker than the node that's immediately next to the gateway. And writing down all those zeros and doing calculations with numbers in the billions is just becomes very inconvenient. So what we do is take the logarithm of the signal strength or the logarithm of the ratios of the signal strengths and uh, we write we multiply it by 10 and then write dB after it. So instead of saying one node is a 10 billion times stronger than the other, we say its signal is 100 decibels stronger than the other. The bottom line is all you really have to remember is 10 dB means 10 times and 3 dB means 2 times. Uh, to get into more details about this, even if you're not very technical, I really recommend this tutorial from Michael Osman. Um, where he goes into uh, decibels and does this beautiful graphical explanation. But for the time being, that's all you need. So let's talk about propagation. So if we have a, a transmitter here and a receiver some distance away, I've drawn towers, but these could be any transmitters and receivers on any frequency. Um, what affects the ability of these two devices to communicate? Um, specifically to LoRaWAN, where does this 10, mile, 10 kilometer maximum range come from? And how can we optimize that range in a practical way? First, let's look at the transmitter side. So your typical transmitter, here's an uh, RFM95 that I know many people are using. Um, this puts out maximum about 20 dBms of power. That is 100 milliwatts. Um, if you're not entirely sure what that means, just, just think of the power as being, uh, as being 20 decibels. As, as the transmitter sends its power out to the antenna, there's some kind of feed line in between that transmitter and the antenna. This may just be a trace on a printed circuit board, or it may be a piece of coaxial cable. Um, here I've written uh, two decibels feed line loss, which might be typical for an embedded application. So by the time you get even just to the base of the antenna, we're already down to 18 dBm of power. Now, the antenna doesn't necessarily radiate all of the energy that hits it from the feed line. Due to mismatch between the antenna and the feed line, what's known as an impedance mismatch, some amount of that power is actually reflected back to the transmitter. Eventually, most of the power gets out, but you will experience some amount of loss no matter how well matched the system is. So here, I figure 1 dB of antenna mismatch loss. Then the antenna has a certain radiation pattern. So whatever antenna you're using, you can look up the data sheet and see what that uh, radiation pattern would be. Um, the most uh, salient number is the antenna gain. Um, in this case, I've chosen uh, 2 dBi, which is a gain of the antennas that come with many of the uh, development kits that we use, a uh, sleeve dipole. So this gain of 2 dB means that the antenna is focusing focusing the energy that it's transmitting in one particular direction, in this case um, in directions perpendicular to the orientation of the antenna. It's focusing the energy there such, such that there's a peak that's 2 dB stronger than you would otherwise expect if the antenna was a point source. This is a trade-off because directly above and below this antenna, there's going to be a null where there's less signal strength. Anyway, for the purposes of discussion here, let's just figure that the receiver is perfectly aligned with the transmitter antenna. So ultimately, out of the transmitter antenna, we're going to see effectively 19 dBm of power. That's known as the transmitter EIRP, or effective isotropic radiated power. So there's a formula down at the bottom. Just the important thing to note is that the positive terms here, like transmitter power, if you increase them, you increase the amount of power that comes out the antenna. If you increase the losses, like the feed line losses, by using less expensive cable or less well-matched instruments, um, you'll have less effective radiated power. 
Now, between the transmit antenna and the receive antenna, there's, there's at least free space. There may be obstacles, but for, let, for right now, let's just figure that there's free space in between and 10 kilometers of free space. There's an equation that you can use to calculate how much loss there will be over that link. In the case of 10 kilometers and 900 megahertz, it comes out to be 111 decibels. So our 19 dBm of power going out that transmit antenna, we only receive negative 92 decibels, 90, negative 92 dBm of power at the receive antenna. This is less than one picowatt. That negative 92 dBm goes into the receive antenna. There's a receive antenna gain, mismatch, and feed line loss, just like we saw on the transmitter side. And ultimately, we receive in this example negative 93 dBm of power at the receiver. Uh, even though that's only that's less than a picowatt, it's enough power for the for that chi that Semtec chip to demodulate the LoRa signal we can receive down to about negative 120 dBm. So if we have perfect line of sight, you can go about 10 kilometers, and you still have a bit of signal margin here. We're at negative 93. We can go down to uh, negative 120. The bad news is, is that there's obstacles. Uh, there may be two brick walls and reinforced concrete uh, in between the transmitter and the receiver. In, in this example, you have 5 dB of attenuation from the brick wall. That means the brick wall absorbs more than twice the energy that comes into it. Less than 50% of the energy that goes into the brick wall actually comes out the other side. After going through several buildings, um, the signal may be attenuated so much that it cannot be received at the other side. And this table here seems not to be displaying correctly, but uh, at this link, you can uh, indoor path loss, um, which I'll share. Uh, you can see what the losses you can expect through brick, glass, masonry, reinforced concrete. So the good news is, is that at 900 megahertz, there's lots of reflections. Uh, nearby buildings will, can create alternate paths for the signal to, to follow. And although there's a loss at the reflection, the reflections are often enough to get a signal through even in dense urban environments. Other good news is that the atmosphere actually refracts signals. The radio signals don't travel in perfectly straight lines. This is because the air is getting cooler and less dense um, as you go higher up in the atmosphere. So there's a rough formula here that, the, based on antenna height, uh, taking this refraction into account, if you have an antenna of height h meters off the ground, you can use this formula to calculate about how far that radio horizon would be, the farthest that you'd be able to reach, uh, assuming that uh, you have enough transmit power to get there. So for an antenna one meter off the ground, you can expect about a four kilometer uh, radio horizon. But if you put the transmitter or the gateway up on a 10 meter pole, you're now looking at a 13 kilometer horizon. So we see the importance here of, of getting uh, the the gateway antennas up high. Another type of propagation that occurs in between our antennas is called knife edge diffraction. This happens a lot in urban environments. So a building or a mountain may block the transmitter and the receiver antennas, creating this shadow zone. However, as, the, as that signal passes over the knife edge at the top of the building, it creates this diffraction pattern and it actually allows some signal to get into that shadow zone. The coverage will be spotty, but it's actually very important in urban propagation, and this is how a lot of our signals are actually being uh, transmitted, especially in New York where we have uh, so many tall buildings. Another type of propagation that does help us to a certain extent is called troposcatter. So in the lower 10 kilometers of the atmosphere, there's enough particles in the air that they actually scatter small amounts of the radio signal back down to Earth. Um, at 900 megahertz, if you use enough power, you can actually reach up to 800 kilometers away. That's way beyond the, radio, the typical radio horizon by pointing the antennas up into the air and scattering off the uh, upper atmosphere. Now, 800 kilometers can only be done if you're using large linear amplifiers, which is only legal for use by the military and radio amateurs for non-commercial use. However, to a limited extent, this scattering is helping us day to day as we connect nodes to gateways. 
Uh, uh, finally, there's one other type of propagation that we see intermittently at 900 megahertz called ducting. So at night, this happens most often at night where the earth is cooling off and it, the earth will cool off faster than the air in a layer just above the surface of the earth. And this creates what's known as a temperature inversion where there's a pocket of warm air just above the ground and then cooler air above it. This can trap signals and cause the signal to be ducted like a, almost like a fiber optic cable and transmitted way farther than it ordinarily would. Uh, experimenters very often communicate at frequencies at 900 megahertz and above up to 24 gigahertz I believe between California and Hawaii using temperature inversions that occur almost nightly there. Um, so we're not going to expect to get that uh, 2,000 mile or almost 4,000 kilometer range with the things network at these low powers. However, I would not be surprised if we see occasional reception from nodes up to 200 kilometers away when conditions are right. So don't use a gateway's GPS coordinates as a, as a firm number. We may see connections uh, much further, but uh, they, they will be sporadic. So taking that all into account, uh, what can we actually do about it? What, what can we practically do to improve uh, the performance of the Things Network? So First of all, we can minimize losses. So when you're setting up a gateway, you want to minimize the feed line losses. That is the coaxial cable losses between the gateway and your outdoor antenna. A good rule of thumb is to keep it under one uh, decibel. This is an error. I should say less than one decibel. Uh, so if you're doing l up to 10 meters of cable, you should use at least the LMR 400 type coax cable. Uh, if you Google uh, coax, coax cable losses or use the link at the end of the presentation, you can see what losses are for different types of cable if you need to go farther than 10 meters. Um, secondly, you should be careful to make sure that your antenna is matched to the frequency on which you're operating it. So in Europe, uh, don't use an American antenna and vice versa. Um, that might seem obvious, but there are some wideband antennas that actually aren't so well matched. So when you look at your antenna's data sheet, make sure that it has an SWR or VSWR uh, of 1.3 to 1 or less. Uh, if you really want to be sure that your antenna is well matched, you can use a device called an antenna analyzer. Uh, they're a little bit expensive at 900 megahertz, but um, if you're installing many gateways, it may be a worthwhile investment. Uh, the antenna analyzer will actually tell you if the antenna is resonant at the frequency you're trying to use it at. Um, you can keep losses down by using good connectors. So for 900 meg and above, we should really be using type N connectors wherever possible. They're a bit bulky, so they shouldn't be used on nodes. But on gateways, um, we should stick with type N connecting to the uh, antennas. Uh, let's see. On nodes, uh, you should try to minimize your antenna mismatch on the node as well. There it's a lot more challenging to measure because there's, it's, it's small, uh, it's difficult to get instruments in there, and many times people are using just whip, uh, small whip antennas that are manually cut to length. So the only advice I have there is just follow reference designs exactly. Read the manufacturer's recommendations on what type of antenna to use, what type of feed line to use, and just follow it to the T. Uh, there are ways to measure it if you have an antenna analyzer, but it gets a bit tricky. Uh, height is the biggest way to minimize losses. Height, every time you raise your antenna up another meter, whether it's on the node or on the gateway, but particularly on the gateway side, uh, it just really increases your range and decreases those path losses, gets more signal over the buildings, and just improves the situation all around. Um, on the gain side, one thing you can do on the gateway is use high gain antennas. So instead of using the stock 2 dBi antenna that comes with, say, the Multitech uh, conduit gateway, you can use a 6 or 8 or even higher uh, dBi antenna that uh, will give you some, some extra range. Uh, this focuses the energy in a horizontal plane, so it is a bit of a trade-off, but uh, when you're trying to connect to a node uh, 10 kilometers away, 
it's very much in that horizontal plane. So using high gain, high gain antennas is is great. Just need to make sure to get make sure they're installed vertically. Uh, similar similarly for the nodes, if possible, you can use a sleeve dipole. Although for many applications, we'll need to use a uh, a chip antenna. Finally. Uh, we can discuss this, but higher transmit power means longer range. It also means you can use a lower spreading factor and consume less airtime. Um, so your node should be capable of high transmit power, even if you don't necessarily need it. Here's a quick, uh, a quick image of some tests that we did in Brooklyn uh, using Brooklyn's first gateway, courtesy of our, our member Manny. It was on the third story roof with an 8 dBi antenna. And we walked around and uh, measured the measured the signal strength around about six blocks away, and we found we could get 900 meters through the blocks. And here, there's just many buildings in the way. Many of these buildings are tall apartment buildings and office buildings. This is a really difficult environment, almost as hard as Manhattan. But we were able to get just about a kilometer away and still receive uh, still receive the signal. The only place we lost the signal was when we walked into this parking garage here where there's reinforced concrete all around it and we were on the on the basement floor uh, so uh, that was a, actually a very encouraging for us that we were able to get this much range uh, in th this difficult environment uh, lastly I'll just leave you with a couple references uh, you'll be able to click these when we when we post the slides uh, there's a coax loss chart that allows you to calculate feed line losses if you're doing outdoor antennas for your gateways there's some SDR tutorials from Michael Osman. Uh, he's really a genius when it comes to explaining things in an easy and fun way. Uh, he also sells open source hardware gadgets for RF, like HackRF and Yardstick One. So I, if anyone's interested in diving more into how RF works and maybe experimenting with SDR, definitely check out Michael Osman. Uh, lastly, a source for most of the material I presented about propagation can be found in the ARRL Handbook for Radio Communications. Uh, it is geared towards amateur radio operators, but it gives the best practical coverage of electronics, antennas, and propagation that I've really found anywhere. So uh, that could be really helpful for our, our um, people installing gateways and building nodes to think about RF and make decisions that will result in that best possible, uh, best possible link budget. Uh, and there, for the records, a table for different types of coax and their losses. The cable that I recommended was LMR400, which you see has 12.8 decibels of loss at 900 megahertz after 100 meters. So you see at 10 meters, we've got 1.2 decibels of loss for on LMR400. You really don't want to go above that uh, 1 or 2 decibel of loss on the, on the feed line. So uh, feel free to ask some questions on Twitter. Uh, and maybe we'll have some time to answer them at the end. Uh, thanks for watching. Awesome, Chris. That was quite a nice insight about the technical side of things, and I'm sure a lot of people would have appreciated uh, sharing your experience and uh, all the knowledge that you've gained so far. I think, uh, yeah, but like Chris mentioned, uh, you can ask questions on Twitter, or you can uh, post questions on the event page, and we'll take those questions after, Ter after Terry's presentation. And now, uh, without wasting much time, I'll introduce Terry, uh, who's the initiator of the New York community. And along with that, he's also the initiator of uh, Ithaca community. And uh, I'll pass it on to him to share his experience now. Well, thanks very much, Rish. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to join this meeting. Um, let me get to the point where I can see my screen and, and I can start talking. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what, what I've learned so far and what we have in, in, in our groups have learned so far about setting up communities and, and uh, some things that may be helpful to you in, in setting up your communities. So I'll be talking about why communities are important, the, the strongly felt idea, ways to look at community, what we did specifically in New York and Ithaca, and some of our rough patches. And then we'll be on to question time. So why are communities important? Well, of course we know that communities build and operate the network. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of other reasons they're important. They're a key value for attracting users to the network. Um, uh, the community 
with the Things Network is something that's really unique. Um, if you try to do wireless IoT using um, uh, cellular, you're you're on your own. I mean, you can talk to the phone company about uh, about getting uh, getting a, a license, but after that, you're really uh, um, pretty much you don't have a, a big group of people to fall back on. Similarly, when using Wi-Fi, um, it's a uh, it's uh, uh, you know wireless is difficult, and there aren't a lot of people who who are in a organized community to tell you um, help you figure out what to do. Communities also help us, the organizers of, the, of, of TTN, to keep in touch with real needs because we get feedback from people in the group. Um, they communities, and this is very important. Also, communities reassure us that there really is value to what we are doing. By, you know, it, it, not only do we get negative feedback, but we get positive feedback. And it helps us learn how to improve what we're doing organizationally. The, I, you know, I think that the, the, the biggest thing you need when you're starting a community is a strongly felt idea. Now, this is plain English for, you know, the mission statement or the, the you know, business school speak. I want to try to use words that are not corporate about this, but it's really important to have a good question about why, a good answer to the question, why am I doing this? I have my answer. I'll offer my answer now. I've been in the business for for, for many many years, and I'm I've become disenchanted with the top down uh, approach to uh, wireless IoT that's driven by large organizations. Whether the large organizations be um, uh, the three GPPs and the, the very large uh, phone companies, or whether they be large semiconductor companies, um, because the um, there's a mismatch between what those companies need and what the individuals who are doing uh, IoT projects need. Um, there, there's just many many mismatches. I could also see the great strength of the Things Network and LoRaWAN technology for the individual practitioners. And then I also feel a very very strongly that there's a huge value to local control and local ownership of our local data. Rather than, than relying on the, the large organizations who require large economic incentives and therefore require some kind of ownership of something, um, I wanted to, you know, I, I was very attracted to the idea of the, the grassroots organization. And finally, I personally really want to enable a wireless uh, IoT to help students learn about embedded systems, to have a, a, an inexpensive uh, system that, that schools can use to help help students um, get their feeling for what this is. Um, now, it, I, I want to say that it's, it's great that your strongly felt idea be clear to others. You'll, you'll, you will, as you keep getting asked, why are you doing this, you'll, you'll get better at, at presenting it. But it's critical that the strongly felt idea be clear and compelling to you, because ultimately, the strongly felt idea is what's going to keep you going through the rough patches, and there will be a lot of rough patches in any organizational development, but particularly with wireless. It's not, it's not always easy. Um, and the other thing about that, that strongly felt idea, practically speaking, um, your, your mission should be some form of service to the community, whether it's for profit or not. It needs to be not just about, about you. Um, and, and if your strongly felt idea really ends up being about you, then that means that, that you know, maybe that means that, that, that what you're doing, there's a mismatch between what you're doing in the community, um, and, and you need to look at that and see how you can align those two better. But certainly, I mean, this is a community effort, and, and, and so your efforts have to be part of that community. Um, there, there are lots of different ways to look at community. Um, you can tell that I have a degree in philosophy. I end up always doing these kinds of um, um, uh, breakdowns. First of all, there's the local community. That's what we're trying to start, um, the, the local uh, things that we're community. But there are a lot of other local aspects. There's the global community that, you know, the, the things network uh, global organization that is, you know, 
doing the development of the key uh, back uh, backhaul technology. They're doing the promotion. They're helping us as we're starting our communities. And they're providing a global uh, forum for interaction. But there are other communities. There's your personal community. Uh, coming into the, the, the in, into all of this, there's the, the personal connections that you have, the other organizations you belong to, and so forth. And there's the regional community. And the regional community is is something that sort of is in between the local and 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 the, the global scale. Um, and, but that's also very important. I think. Um, if you look at the communities that I'm organizing, I'm I'm organizing I'm initiating two communities, one in New York City and one in Ithaca. And it's it, so to give you an idea of my perspective uh, of the the uh, of how I'm looking at this. Um, it's good to compare them. Um, New York City is huge. You know, I say 10 million people. I think it's actually more than that. But this is you know, orders of magnitude. Ithaca is tiny, um, 100k. Um, so uh, Ith New York City is dense. Ithaca is is the, the population is spread out. Um, New York City is a strong uh, Meetup.com ecosystem. Uh, Ithaca, not so much. Um, uh, Ithaca, New York City has a very diverse economy. Ithaca, College Town, um, it's really oriented around uh, Cornell and Ithaca College. They're the biggest employers are educational. New York City is a hard network environment, uh, difficult, um, and particularly Manhattan, but, but you know, much of New York City is, is just difficult. Ithaca, on the other hand, is pretty easy. Um, the local area is basically flat, uh, what's called a penny plain with, with a bunch of gouges that the glaciers dug when, when they came through a few uh, 10,000, 20,000 years ago. So um, um, you can cover it with a more agricultural, the, the, the rural figures of thumb that you see in the data sheets. Uh, culturally, New York City is much more of a, of a Slack and Twitter kind of place. Um, Ithaca is more Facebook and email. You know, so uh, you see people in, in New York City are using the Google Google Docs and Google Tools a lot. Ithaca, not so much. It's more you know Windows and, and uh, Word and, and the sort of traditional stuff. So with that in mind, let's talk about um, uh, what we did in um, in New York. First of all, well, historically, I started first in New York. I, I, I saw Venki's presentation in February of this year. I immediately went out and bought a, a gateway and set it up, um, and and you know registered the gateway. And, and, and to my astonishment, um, ended up as the initiator of New York City. Um, um, shortly after that, I was invited by. Um, uh, by the Netherlands uh, consulate to exhibit at New York Tech Day. Now, one of the things I'm showing here in this chart is I'm sort of showing, based on remember the, my slide of various communities, I'm sort of categorizing which networks, which communities are feeding into each of these actions that have led us to where we are today. So the next, the first step was personal. I did something. The next step was global. Um, the 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 things network. Um, set me up as initiator, and and the Netherlands consulate got us the booth at at, at New York Tech Day. Um, th then I spent some more effort to uh, to be able to give the demo. Uh, Johan spent a, a bunch of time on me the, the night before uh, the night before helping me to, to get this set up, and so did Multitech. So um, the uh, there was a, a global. Community input. There was a personal community input. One of the reasons that Multitech spent a bunch of time with me is that I actually independently knew Multitech before I started all of this. So um, the, all community effort there. Um, from that, I had invitations to speak, and from that, I started developing the, the strong, I strongly felt idea about why the Things Network is important uh, to the local community, to New York City. We had our personal, we had our organizing meeting, and uh, and and suddenly we had a, a core group. You know, it was a, a very rapid uh, transition. Part of that is because New York City has a very large population, so I was able to draw on a large population of, of technically skilled people. And and um, at that point, I, I I made the transition from being a doer to sort of being the the organizer. Um, 
Ithaca was different. It's a much smaller community, and maybe there, there aren't that many New Yorks around. Um, there are a lot more communities that are the size of Ithaca or larger. Um, I think there's like 250 cities like this in the United States. Um, I started with the knowledge base from having done, done it in New York. Um, my next step was to talk to my friends in Ithaca about, about what's going on. So I used my local knowledge and my personal network. I set up a meetup group. Even though meetups aren't really very active here, um, it was a uh, um, it was something that that I did anyway because it gave me a, a an easy way of doing things the same way basically saved my energy, um, and we and because I had grabbed a couple of co-opted a couple of people to help me, they were also able then to use their personal context to go to go uh, to go find people. Um, so we had a preliminary meeting after which we decided on a name, set up infrastructure, GitHub, the website, this kind of stuff. And then a very key thing for Ithaca was that one of our members wrote and distributed a press release. And of course, as, as initiator, you have to be involved with that. You have to write your quote, typically. Um, uh, I, I uh, asked Vinky if he'd be willing to, to contribute a quote. And he said, sure, what would you like me to say? So I wrote his quote, and he said, sure. Okay, and that's how it works with press releases. Actually, normally, you you you, uh, you sort of uh, if you, if you're the energy behind a press release, you do all the work, and and you you if you can get someone to give you a quote, great. But if you can't, you write their quote, and they say, yeah, I like it. Um, off of that, um, then then uh, um, John Bozak, who's uh, one of our members and you know, had had contacts with the local media, I got several requests for interview. We got several articles in in the local. Uh, press and local on-site online press, um, uh, and as a result, our, our our first big meeting we had uh, close to 30 people in the room. Um, uh, during that meeting, I brought in an outside speaker again using some of the using the the, the some more of a regional connection because uh, he, this was using the Montevideo group, which is a uh, which I found through the, the global stuff, or he found us through the global stuff, but uh, um, they're using 915, and so I thought that was really very relevant uh, to, to, uh, to explain to us what it was going to be like. And also, Montevideo is a lot more like Ithaca than New York City is like Ithaca. It's, it's, a, it's a medium-sized city with a, a you know, the local, the local economy outside the city is strongly agriculture-based, which matches upstate New York. So, I have some slides about you know sort of talking about the personal network. This is an attempt. This is a hope. I hope to give people who are struggling with you know how do I get beyond the the, the, the desire to start a community to, to how do I actually do it. So I'm giving you some ideas here of the, the kinds of community you already have, even if even if the things network in your area is just just nascent. Um, you still have lots of other communities that you can work with. You're, there's your personal com, uh, community. Um, there's the people you know, there's the people that they know, they're the companies that you know and who know you. Um, there are the organizations you belong to, um, and if your strongly felt idea beyond, extends beyond tech, as, as mine did, mine, mine really extends to, to, to education and, and local economic development, um, it's natural to think about your personal, local, social, religious, Non-government organization and governmental connections, and then you mine your LinkedIn. If you've got if you if you've got a LinkedIn account where you've got connections, um, if you're like me, um, uh, you don't you don't always make those connections unless you go you know use the tool and sort of see who do I know that's interested in this stuff. And, and that can be very helpful in, in sort of organizing your approach. Um, the local communities. Okay, well now that that one we know about. There's your 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 the Very you slides. Well, sorry, are my slides not are my slides not visible? Right. I seem to have dropped off then. When did they drop off? Oh, they never showed up, I think. That's why I found one comment on the events page uh, mentioning about these slides. I'll share again. Looks like it did drop off. Ah, oh, there we go. So sorry. 
thank you for interrupting. And my apologies. Uh, the slide deck will be posted, so you can you can catch up on the stuff that you didn't see. Um, the the local communities are are things like uh, of course there's the, there's your things network uh, local group um, and it's it's critical to have at least one or two other people involved as early as possible. Um, uh, there are affinity groups and and some I've listed here some of the affinity groups that I find um, um, helpful um, in terms of spreading the word. There's that. Every community has a has an amateur radio group. They're naturals for, 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 for this technology and for, for this mission. Um, there are IoT meetups. Because of the, the bubble in IoT, there are typically almost everywhere you go, there are people who, who have heard about IoT and who are interested. Um, in larger cities, you'll have embedded systems related meetups. Um, you'll have student groups. Um, at, at the local universities, at the local high schools, you'll have robotics groups. You'll at the at at, at the high schools, often at, even also at the universities, you'll have uh, perhaps embedded systems. You'll have engineering groups if you've got an engineering school and so forth. Maker spaces, incubators. There may be also think about industry-specific meetups where you know that that industry ought to have interest. Agriculture is a big one. As as people keep saying at the meetings I go to this week, farmers are natural tinkerers. They're often early adopters of technology and. LoRaWAN is really, really very good for farmers. Even if you're doing urban agriculture, there's just lots of things you can do, and you'll get lots of, of people interested, and you'll get some energy. Um, there are some applications in, in medical. Um, we're seeing that in, in New York City, where some large organizations are looking at, at, at the Things Network for not healthcare, but, but infrastructure management in medical. Because if you're running a large hospital, the infrastructure is, is pretty um, substantial. Um, a lot of environmental uh, uses, environmental monitoring uh, uses of, of the Things Network. Uh, uh, you might want to look at some of the um, what you might call advocacy groups. Um, uh, things like um, um, you know think groups that are encoding minorities, uh, encouraging minorities to write code. Groups that are um, uh, in, uh, advocating community development, uh, community economic development. Um, Relocalization communities, these kinds of things. Local businesses are part of your community. Some of them will be interested in this. Um, local education. Um, it, we've gotten a huge amount of help um, just with, with them out without them spending much money from the City University of New York. Uh, they've, they've contributed an intern who's been instrumental in doing uh, some of the some of the work that we've been doing in, in developing the New York City community. Local government. Um, you know, in a smaller community, it's pretty easy to reach the people in your local government and get them interested. In a in a city like New York City, you know, you sort of have to get your act together first, and, and, and so you know that that's a, you have to judge in all of these things. You know, what's your best approach? Um, there's also local regional offices of global businesses. This can be very fruitful. You know, if I'm thinking of things like IBM Zurich, who've been key in development of the of the technology, and, and it's, I don't think it's an accident that Zurich is is a big area for for uh, the things that work. Um, KPMG has been very important um, in supporting the development of the of the network. They're in they're in Amsterdam, they're in New York City, and you know there are other places, and so they they might be someone to approach. Um, Global communities. Well, of course, there's the TTN group, and you should take advantage of that. Um, you can work with uh, with with Rishi and 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 his colleagues, and and um, and they will give you lots of ideas and help and and uh, and, and support. There are the forums. Um, in addition to the global stuff, though, there's some other stuff you should think about. You should you should be working with uh, Twitter. Uh, community because the Twitter group, the, the, the Twitter world right now, the IoT hashtag is extremely fruitful for finding out what's going on in the Internet of Things and extremely useful for getting the word out about what you're doing. So um, I have been, you know, actually fairly surprised by by how well Twitter has been working for for our groups on this. Um, I found they have made a number of connections that way. Um, uh, global businesses, um, you know that this is, you know, you try to hook up with people like Semtech. Uh, um, if, if what you're doing is interesting, you try to hook up with people like Multitech if you're using their stuff. 
um, uh, microchip. Um, global media, um, and, you know, global media, it's, it's hard as a local group to really do. This is an area where you want to be thinking about it, and if you have an opportunity, of course, do it. But really, the global media, this is something that, that, that TTN Global is doing, and, and they have a better position for doing it because they're talking about it from the global perspective. Um, the global communities, but you should follow what's going on in the global. This is a part, an important input for you from, from community. Um, global trade associations, again, this is an important input for you, you know, following what IETF, following uh, Laura Wan Alliance, getting involved with Laura Wan Alliance to the degree that your budget allows. Um, but there's a, there are a lot of resources there. But finally, there's the, the regional communities. Um, and um, the, uh, um, this is important, um, and, and it's an area where you as an initiator you uh, need to go find the other initiators in your region and work with them to help develop this because th this is a, a, an area of, of, uh, where there's a, a real positive benefit if you can play this correctly and it's also an area where, where, um, where there's not yet sort of a regional organization. Um, so there's the, the, by regions I mean the United States, I mean the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so your 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 local political unit that's bigger than where you're trying to set up the network and so forth. Media is an important area. This is where you know if, if you're in the United States, um, a lot of the United States media is is not global in nature, and so that's an area where you as a as a regional initiator or working with other local initiators can can do some work to get attention. And finally, there are our trade events. So let's talk about the rough patches so I can finish up and let you, then we can get to the questions. Um, so th this slide is, is the good news, the rough patches that we solved. Um, I had really, I had terrible trouble getting good coverage from the gateway in my New York City office and this affected my confidence in the technology. And this was resolved by, by the, com the local community doing tests which convinced me that this was my problem, not the technology's problem. And this was confirmed when we installed a second gateway in better location. So another rough patch, we had trouble getting endpoints working on US 915 with over-the-air uh, authentication. And this affected my confidence in being able to give the technology to the community adopters. It's one thing to give this to engineers. I mean, since, my, since my strongly felt uh, idea is that I want to give this to the community beyond the engineering community, it was really important to me that I feel positive that we could you know, deploy the technology and that people could get on to solving their problem without dealing with the details. And OTAA is a very important part of that. And when it wasn't working, I was extremely discouraged. But this got solved because we worked on it. And, we, and, and, and you know, MCCI and, and CUNY, you know, did my company's MCCI and, and CUNY did, did some work on this and got it to the point where, where we felt good about that. Um, third thing was that other people didn't share my strongly felt idea. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, I, I'd tell people it's what I want to do, and they'd say, oh, yeah, well, that's interesting. And that was solved by inviting others to come speak, especially here at Ithaca, getting Here Lab to come speak, Patrick Phillips, um, come speak, you know, electronically to a meeting of the group. You know, he came in and he articulated not just an idea, but he's actually acted on an idea similar to mine and gotten it to fruition with the LoRaWAN technology. And so that suddenly means that it's not just me. You've got backup from other people. You've got people who are ahead of you who say, oh, yeah, this is doable. This isn't just um, soap that, that some crazy guy is selling. So um, rough patches, too. So um, these are the things we haven't solved yet. And this is an example of the kind of things that you'll constantly have to work with as you go through your, your community development. Um, we don't have a good answer when, when people ask, is there a literature package? Um, you know, we can point people at web links, but there's nothing coherent uh, for the, the, that I feel that I can give people who are not technically um, uh, deeply educated. Um, people who are deeply educated but not technical um, are actually my target, and, and I don't have anything for them. Um, we're working on that. Um, the second rough patch is that not enough gateways are deployed yet. Um, you know, we, you can't really do a, a, an interesting application in either of my communities because there just isn't enough coverage. Um, 
some of that you know some of that has been held up because we needed better installation instructions for for my audience so and I this was to build my confidence in asking people to go do this um, we needed a success kit um, so that the the smart non-technical people when they got their gateway and set it up they could immediately do something with it and see that it's working um, uh, we've got now got a prototype that, that I've developed with, with my company um, we need exciting evidence that, that this works to motivate others and, and that's happening with the the site scans that we've been doing both in Ithaca and in New York and in Ithaca and also with you know talking to people like Patrick Phillips and Pierre Lemon. And the last thing, of course, is that the not solved yet is is being patient. You know, um, in the technology world, you tend to want like you want to see it now. You want to see something happening, and you get frustrated when stuff just takes a while. Um, but and you know, you just still need to just keep transmitting the strongly felt idea to others and 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 help convert that to action. There are a bunch of resources on this slide, which. Um, um, which you can use if you want to build on the work that we've done. One of the things that, that the New York and Ithaca groups have, have, have really felt strongly about is we want to make this possible to, to take what we learn and, and, and make it possible for other people to build on it. And um, so we're, we're very uh, eager to get um, uh, questions from people and, and uh, um, to try to help the next stage of, of communities and, and to, to sort of build, to build a, a kit to help people do this. We've got some of this ready. Some of it we, we may have forgotten to, to, to write stuff down or it's in personal notes and we have to get it on the GitHub. When people ask is typically when it happens. One thing I want to uh, I want to be you know, I want to tell you out of personal experience you want to be very careful when you're choosing images to, to put up on a website um, because um, uh, you can get it can, you can, it can be an expensive mistake if you get an image that you can't back up your claim that that it's it you've got the rights to put it on your website. Um, people like Getty are always looking for they're using automated tools they're scanning websites they're looking for for misappropriated images and if they if you have an image that you don't have a, a valid license to use it can get really expensive if it's, if it's one of Getty's images. So um, a, a second thing on branding. Um, uh, there are, a, if you haven't done this before, follow the standard guidebooks on sizing and formatting your images for each one of the, the places where you're putting your images. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting, I look around um, and it's a, a, a common thing that, that, that people who, who are setting this stuff up and doing lots of different things, they don't think about, well, I got to resize this and, and make it exactly right to make it look good on the screen. Um, that's it. So I want to say thank you very much for uh, for your attention and for listening, and, and uh, thanks to, to the Things Network for setting this up. Awesome. Thanks a lot, I'm sure uh, there was some hidden insight about uh, what not to do and what things to do to manage a community, and uh, more on that. I think um, there's one question which uh, I've been, I have uh, for you, and that is uh, that. How do you see the importance of a use case while building a community? I mean, you've been an initiator of two communities now, and I've seen things around. So how do you see the value of a use case? Well, that's a really, um, that's a really good question. Um, um, it depends to a large degree on your audience. The, um, the, what I have found is that some audiences really obsess on the use case and some some don't. Um, the the um, so so um, I tr I definitely believe in in what uh, uh, at our last at the last uh, webinar the TTN webinar uh, the the presentation slide said you know nobody ever you know it's like you know come up with a use case and I'll build a network you know that's not how it works. Um, um, or come up with a hypothetical network and all build a use case. Typically, the way things really work in engineering is that you have to get people something they can work with before the use cases will start to happen. But you still have to solve the problem of helping people imagine what this might be. So you have to you have to have some reason for people to get excited about this. And and non-technical people. Um, may not have the faith that technical people that that the that the use cases will will just come automatically. 
out of this. They're, 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 or they may, you know, get crazy ideas about what the use cases might be if you don't come up with with um, with grounded, uh, well-grounded use cases. There's a fine line to walk between being between um, you know, be between you know, giving people some detail and 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 getting 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 lost in the details. It's very important to sort of say, well, look, you know, there are use cases. Here are some use cases um, from various other sites. Um, um, the the uh, the main thing to bear in mind is that the use cases may not be very compelling to your local community. You know, I mean, at one example of a use case that that is. That 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 is great in some communities and not great in other communities is the um, the, the the Amsterdam lead use case of uh, monitoring water and boats. Um, that I think is a great use case. Um, uh, and in Ithaca, people think that's a great use case because you know Ithaca's got a big lake and there are people who've got boats and, and so it's and, and and it's a sort of democratic activity. In New York City, boating is not really a democratic activity. And so talking about that use case doesn't fit with my, um, with my strongly felt idea that this is a profoundly democratic technology and that, that the reason I want to do it is for reasons of, of equity. Um, so um, if, if I were to, you know, in, in New York, if you start talking about something that makes life good for voters, you get pigeonholed. And, and, and you don't want to get pigeonholed. So, so you need to choose your use case there. And in New York, we tend to talk about trash cans. You know, and, you know, the, the, you know when a trash can gets full, you know, the, 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 you know that you have to go empty it instead of sending somebody around on a schedule to empty all the trash cans, whether they need to be emptied or not. So, Every city is different, and the use case for every city um, has to be somewhat different. That's why you want to have, as soon as you can, a, a, a core group of two or three people that you can bounce ideas off of and come up with some straw man use cases. Those might not be what you pilot, but, but they will be enough to get, start getting the next round of people that come into your group thinking along the same lines as how you're thinking. Awesome. Uh, Chris, uh, I have one more question for you, and uh, I think uh, being the community manager, I've uh, faced this question uh, too many times. And the question is that a lot of people uh, are looking to initiate a community at this side, but they're not really well versed with the technical side of things. And uh, so, what's going? What's your advice for them to get started and kind of get some education on that part? Uh, great, great question, Rish. Well, at the risk of being um, a bit of an evangelist. I, I recommend that people look into amateur radio. Now, this is if you're interested in radio beyond just the Things Network. Uh, if you're just looking to work on the Things Network and you have a very specific use case, uh, it would be quite a distraction. But if you want to learn more about, the, uh, about RF, um, how to design antennas, and get a really uh, a, a gut feeling for how the technology works, uh, amateur radio is an amazing resource. So at least here in the States, uh, you can get a license for $15 for 10 years, and you have to take a simple knowledge test, but then you're allowed to operate on many different frequency bands with up to 1,500 watts of power. And there's a whole community of people, largely from a previous generation, who experiment with this all the time. And uh, it was actually the amateur radio community that... Um, discovered a lot of the propagation characteristics and developed many of the modes that we use today um, for, for communication. So that is a, a great resource there, both the, the documentation that's been written for amateur radio, but really speaks to radio in general, and just that community, as Terry mentioned, tapping into those people and connecting them with IoT uh, has been really valuable for me. Personally, I knew very little about RF, I was scared of it prior to getting into amateur radio, and now I, I feel very confident about it and have this gut feeling. So that's the first place that I'd look um, if people are interested in radio more broadly. Awesome. 
Thanks, Chris, for the uh, answer. Uh, Terry, I have one more question from Muhammad here on the Google Events page. And he says, uh, have you guys ever faced any trouble from the government or any law enforcement in terms of creating a network for public use, wherein uh, people are not paying any fees and they cannot control or monitor it? Well, that's a good question. We, we, we worry about that. Um, you know, um, it, it, we worry about that in the form of the, in the United States, we worry about that in the form of the question, you know, what do we do when the bad guys figure out how to use this network to do something bad? You know, so, so, you know, that was like, that question was asked, I think, at our first group meetup. Um, the thing is that, that, you know, in the United States, um, uh, the, the political situation is still such that, that um, um, we're pretty free uh, to go do this kind of experimentation. And it's, it's sort of, uh, you don't have to prove in advance that you're going to do no harm. Um, the, uh, the, in other countries, you know, that's a, a, a bigger consideration. and You have to look at your local, at your local uh, situation. I've heard from people in many different countries who are doing this. Some of them are, are fairly, uh, are much more strictly regulated in the United States, and, and it's not, um, you know, it's it's not such a. They don't have the. They don't. They don't seem to feel the concern. Um, you know, I mean, there's a the Things Network is deployed in uh, is in, is it uh, Wainan, right uh, in in China, um, and uh, it's deployed in. Um, um, uh, a number of, of South American countries with, with di different levels of, of legal system and so forth. I think that the, um, the, the, real, the real thing to say is, you know, what can you do with LoRaWAN that you couldn't do with Wi-Fi? And the answer is not really much. I mean, if you're, if you're a bad guy, um, Wi-Fi is uh, much easier to work with, and there's lots more ways that you can, you can use it. Um, uh, and uh, cellular is even you know even more broad, broad spread, you know, and there's lots of ways that you can use it and misuse it. Laura doesn't really uh, Laura makes is much more economical, in, but that those economies really only apply if you're doing thousands upon thousands of things. And a bad guy is not going to be able to deploy thousands upon thousands of nodes without getting noticed. You know, that's just not really sort of a, a, a it's not a likely attack scheme. You know, what's more likely is that they'll be, you know, doing, you know, a, a small group doing something small but, but, but major. And, uh, and so, um, so from a reasonableness point of view, I think that it's, 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 it's reasonable to say that Laura is not really making things any worse. Um, from a regulatory point of view, of course, you know, I mean, this is something that somebody decides, not not that's ba and it's not necessarily based on logic and evidence. It's based on on emotions and 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 feelings, and and you have to work with that. Um, one good thing to tell people I, that you know is like the data is doubly encrypted. Um, um, which means that that uh, there's less opportunity for somebody to, to put in a, a bad gateway and and do something bad because they can't really they can they can they can't really easily prevent other gateways from from being able to forward the data even if they don't forward the data and and because of the encryption it's hard for them to inject traffic. Um, you know, at this point, you're on to second order kinds of things that every network, every network has to worry about. So, so um, uh, I don't know if I've answered the question. I hope you're posting follow-up questions if I'm like off in the off in the weeds about what you're worried about. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Terry, for answering the question. Uh, so I think uh, this is uh, almost time uh, that we come to the end of the session. It was, I think, great uh, meeting Terry and Chris. Uh, Chris was regarding the technical side of things, and I'm sure a lot of people would have uh, understood things which they probably wouldn't know about. And uh, Terry, thanks a lot again for uh, sharing your experience and sharing things that uh, people should do or shouldn't do. So it was great catching up with uh, both of you as well. Uh, for everyone else, uh, you can still post your questions on the Google Events page. Uh, Terry, myself, and Chris will keep an eye out, and we'll answer them uh, on the page itself. 
And for uh, everyone else, uh, we'll be continuing the series every couple of weeks. So watch out on social media and uh, the newsletter. We'll post a date and session for the next webcast soon. Um, I hope you all enjoy the session and uh, enjoy the weekend, everyone. I will see you later. Bye-bye.